In the mighty name of Jesus. For all of the things we give you glory, we give you adoration. May your name be highly exalted, may your name be glorified. We thank you for letting us gather here for this seminar today, Lord. We pray that for whatever we're going to exchange among ourselves, Lord Father, let it be beneficial to our lives. And, oh Lord, please, I ask that it shall not only be beneficial, and that we should be able to apply it to various areas of our lives as necessary in the mighty name of Jesus. Therefore, I thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for we shall have a successful meeting. And in the end, all glory and adoration shall be returned to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you so much, Kabiwe Odum, for leading us in prayer. Uh, so uh, my remark will be quite simple. Uh, uh, I've said a lot even before we prayed. Uh, our core belief is how we can impart and how we can help each other grow in our place of career development and projection. Uh, so after today's presentation that... Uh, We'll be talking about our uh, introduction to drilling, just the way we started with introduction to completion in our first edition last year, before we went into seismic and area, talked more about geosciences and little geophysics. Now we are going into uh, drilling. I know most YPs has asked series of questions about drilling, different kind of drilling, different kind of rig. Today we are privileged to have a, a young professional that distinguished itself in this area of assignment. Uh, he's a seasoned professional. And uh, from his tight schedule, we have to plead. And today is available to share his wealth of knowledge with us. So I advise all of us to get our pen and uh, ask the questions you want to ask uh, so you can learn. Uh, it's something that has to do with uh, experience, something that has to do with uh, knowledge, uh, both theoretical and practical. He's going to tell us a bit of it. So I thank everybody that have joined this call and this meeting today. And let's be open-minded. Let's be open to be teachable and trainable so we can get the required tool to fill our careers in our different areas. Uh, just to tell all of us that Education 103 is a science family. Uh, we are not limited to fully personal engineers. Uh, that's why we are a unique professional body. So that's why we are doing this presentation. We get resource persons, so people in all that discipline, electrical, mechanical, civil, geology, computer science, mathematics, geophysics, name it, all in the science family will not be uh, really off the point of not knowing the in and out of the oil and gas industry. So that's why we decided to do the basis of this so we can learn and ask uh, the necessary question for us to be acquainted uh, in the oil and gas space. So thank you very much for being here. That's my three minutes up. I will just go on uh, the YP. I, I have seen the YP co-chairman. Dorcas, are you there? Hello? Dorcas, are you there? Yeah, good evening, sir. Oh, uh, please, uh, please, can you give a... Uh, the introduction speech on behalf of the YP chairman. Uh, on the call, we have our co-YP chairman. So she's, she will be speaking on behalf of the YP chairman. So the floor is open to you, Dr. That wasn't captured in the agenda, but you can go ahead, Ma. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I hope I am loud and clear and everybody can hear me um, clearly and actively. Like he said, my name is Dokas Jimmy. I am the YP co-chair, uh, currently working with Peseta University, a world-class university that is still in establishment. Thank you so much, everybody that has joined. Thank you, our amazing speaker, for being willing to jump in and fill in the gap, even on short notice. We really and sincerely do appreciate um, I, I have done one or two ALP and technical lecture for you as a moderator. So I'm looking forward to this because I know you're a seasoned engineer and you're going to do justice to this topic. And to all our fellow YPs that have joined, um, I'm urging you all to stay till the end. It should be worth your time, your data, and your listening ears. And like our 
chairman for the technical committee had said, um, get your pen and your paper and get ready to jot down some important facts and ask some questions that will be educative and learning to everyone here. Um, for those of us that are not here yet and can reach out to our friends, um, let's do that while the section is going on, drop a message or a reminder or something so more people can join and get to learn from this program. Thank you, Section 103, for this opportunity and for having the YPs at heart and giving us opportunity and space to be able to educate ourselves, equip ourselves and grow better and know more about the energy industry that we're all striving in. Thank you so much for everybody. I really do appreciate and I look forward to being with us here till the end and the success of this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jimmy, our able co-IP chairman of SP Paracos section. I celebrate the volunteerism. I celebrate your commitment when it comes to doing what you know how to do best and minding and filling the gap for us. Thank you so much. The talk on our agenda is a reading of uh, the presenter profile. Can you project that, please, Simeon? OK. Not this, the other one, Simeon. Um, can I just project my screen? I think I also have it. Okay, screen. just project from your end, Daniel. Yeah, so Simeon can To my screen now. You're not seeing your screen. Oh, oh Daniel, would, would it be ideal if uh, Simeon project the previous one, then when you start your presentation, you can project it. Okay, if you're no going to take out, yeah. Uh... Simeon, can you pre uh, project the other one? Which of them? Is the it the agenda you, or the one, one I... No, the other one, the other one. The, the first one you projected. The one I removed last. Yes, the one you removed. So Dana will project his profile and I will take it from there before he continues his presentation. So okay. we don't, so we can work on with timing. Okay. Sorry for that delay, you're missed up. Okay, uh, we'll just do a quick one here. Uh, our presenter, uh, Maduago Daniel, uh, this is quite offline. He, he used to be my senior in school. So I have three years ahead then in school. And uh, we used to know him as a person that has so much passion for education. Uh, it's a privilege to have him here. He's a product of uh, University of Port Harcourt, uh, being Gene Petroleum Engineering, uh, software programming. 
that when he was in school, then TIG leader, SP Uniport, project work, gas pipeline, optimization, using visual basis. Visual basis is probably uh, a software that he use in the oil and gas industry. Then he works for AGIP and any cooperative university. That's where he went and further education, Italy. Uh, he has areas, these are areas he has worked um, where he has uh, shown and built competence in his professional growth. Uh, drilling engineering, computer engineering, software production engineering. Uh, he has a, a BMA, a MSc in quality health, safety and environment, and is an IOS satisfied. Uh, he's someone that uh, has passion and for career good and projection. So this is his little profile. Once I give Daniel the floor to start his presentation, he's going to project his citation, which I'm still going uh, to flow and inform us more on about the presenter we have today. So Mr. Daniel, if you're ready, you can share your screen. Okay, yeah. Sharing now. Okay. Good evening, everybody. So this is the profile and citation of Daniel Maduago. Daniel is a graduate of petroleum engineering, Uniport, same with University State College University of Portacos. He started off his professional career as a drilling engineer in any, but knowledge led him to become a completion engineer after giving support to several drilling and completion activities from Axel. He further progressed offshore where he became a subsea engineer supporting several deep offshore projects. Project. Over the years, he gradually developed passion for HLC due to the important role safety plays at the workplace and the tool to maximize productivity. This made him decide to pursue that dream and proceeded for his master's degree in HLC at University of Pisa, Italy. He's currently an operational uh, an operation safety engineer on an FPSO and field security advisor for an offshore field. He's currently an active YP and the leader of HFC Technical Interest Group of Section of SP Section 100 of that code, who likes to travel, volunteer, and network. Please, can we welcome Engineer Daniel Madwago as he takes the floor? Can we give a clap, please? Good evening, all. I don't know if it's necessary to put on my camera. I don't know. Anyway, uh, the what? network. If you want. Uh, hey, anyone. Do I need to put on my Let's camera? see the screen. My camera. The slide. Okay, the if slide you want to, as far as it won't obstruct the, the slide. Oh. Okay, and anyway, that's just one. Um, I'll first start by apologizing for several reasons. One, well, I think we're a bit behind schedule. And two, secondly, I am currently on an offshore location, and believe me, the network is a bit erratic. So I am hoping we won't have any disruption, especially in the audio. And uh, I hope we'll have a smooth sail with the presentation. Then also, being that I'm at the I mean, you may hear some noise around because several activities are going on here. But I just beg you to try and focus on my voice and filter out any other noise here around me. In case you hear a PA announcement here, just understand. That's the result of my presentation. Just ignore it. Anyway, straight up uh, for the activity for today. Uh, it's a technical lecture on fundamental, fundamentals of drilling operations. Uh, I find it, I don't usually like, like using the word technical lecture because people think it's something very technical. People that have attended some of my uh, lectures understand that I make it a fun discussion. Actually, it's less technical when you find out that it's actually very, very technical. 
my objective today is to make sure that everybody listening here ends up being a seasoned drilling engineer. Being that you know, working to an office where you see drilling professionals discussing about a drilling operation, you can easily sit down on the table, contribute, and ask relevant questions. And I hope to achieve this by briefly introducing uh, the subject matters for us. We go straight to the objectives of drilling. We see how rigs are classified and we'll look at the main components of any rig. Then quickly we go through types of wells and their profiles. We also narrow it narrowly more into the drill string and the drill string components and the BHA. BHA means bottom hole assembly. A quickly look at some well designs and how they do sequentially. We know that every operation has the challenges, so we look at some drilling challenges. If time permits, we'll do a very quick uh, drilling operation exercise just to be sure that we understood the presentation and prior to the lecture. To conclude, and I'll give the floor for personal answers. So I'll try to be very fast, and uh, please, anything you think you need to understand, just jot it down in the end. We'll take all the questions. So brief introduction. You know that the crude oil is built up of um, this guy natural gas, hydrocarbons, and some other trace elements, which are not hydrocarbon, for example, so forth. Now, in the industry, you understand that the best way to get this hydrocarbon, which, which is of our interest, is to extract them for resources from via drilling. How do we extract them? We drill the hole down to your target where the reservoir is, where the hydrocarbon and we take it out from here, simple. Then how do we do this? We have to create the well. And I said, we drill the hole down to the head cross. We require rigs to do these activities. And uh, the main cutting equipment is the bit. So for every drilling activity, at the end, end of your drill string, you have a bit. Now, how do we do this? There are several methods. Several methods. They have their benefits and they have their disadvantages. So, at the end of today's lectures, we will know which we can use for any situation we find ourselves. Then, the main objective of building a well is basically to connect the surface to the target, which is your reservoir. And um, basically, for three reasons. One, is that just to explore? to appraise or to develop. When, by exploration, we mean the, um, designing a well to assess the subsurface prospects. These are the prospects that uh, comprise of a commercial amount of hydrocarbons. So before you do your exploration well, you must require certain information from the geologists who have done some seismic survey. The exploration well basically is to tell you, OK, the geologists will call us in the drilling department. Guys, um, we've done some survey. We we'll use our geophones and our hydrophones. We think there's the, the graph is showing that there's something like a reservoir here, but we're not sure. So they call us in the drilling department. Okay, so let's go and drill an exploration well. So basically, we go to a location where they carry out this seismic survey. We carry out the map and we drill. Exploration well are usually very, very dangerous because we are going blindly. Never drilled anywhere in that location. So when you go to drill exploration well, we usually take a lot of um, safety precautions. Now let's say we drill that exploration well, and luckily we strike oil. We've seen oil. Yes, we have. We have confirmed that the geologists are right with their their seismic survey, but we don't know if this oil is uh, any commercial quantity. It may just be a very little oil we saw. Now we need to drill what they call our pressure wells. Our pressure wells are drilled at certain distance to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. That's the operation well that discovered oil. The idea first is to understand how far or how wide the reservoir is. One well cannot tell us. So we need to drill several pressure wells to first give us this information. So we drill meters or kilometers away from the Primary exploration where they found oil, forward, backwards, left, and right. And that way we draw a map, and usually we see this fancy full design of this graph that always looks like a dome shape. That's how we get our graph. It gives us information about the oil 
the hydrocarbon oil contacts or the gas oil contacts. We draw this map and we understand the height of the reservoir, the thickness of the reservoir. In the process of doing this appraisal, where we also collect samples, core samples, and we give group for further analysis. So once we have this information, we have the image of what we believe the reservoir looks like. Now we drill development wells. Development wells are the wells you use to either produce the oil or in certain cases to inject water or gas. Now this is just a quick um, explanation of the different kind of wells. So for exploration and present development, there are also different kinds of wells under each of these um, activities. So to drill a well, I mentioned earlier, we need rigs. Now these rigs are classified depending on the location of your land or your sea. When I say sea, I mean also swamp areas. So your mind should not go to just a uh, very deep option. So for land rigs, they are usually very light, you know. When I say light, I mean in terms of the horsepower. We have the heavy land rigs, light land rigs, and helicopter, helicopter portable rigs. We also have trailer mounted rigs. Um, there are several, several that are very common rigs that we see. Uh, there's not so much of technological advancement here, apart from um, a case where uh, 2000 and 13. There's a rig I visited in the field in Milan. In Italy, sorry. The rig that is almost automated, fully automated. You have only the driller and one person. Every other thing is automated. The hydraulic hoisting rig. So these are advancements in land rigs, but they are not, there are really no so much advancements in that area. So then also, I forgot to mention that my experience is both land and offshore. So sometimes you may see me in my discussion as far from land to offshore. So I don't be able to flow with the conversation. They are basically the same philosophy. Now for the marine rigs, which are for the offshore rigs, it can either be floating or bottom supported. Bottom supported are rigs that touch the bottom of the sea. So with the name, you can understand these are rigs that only work in shallow waters. So in swamp area or very shallow offshore areas. Those kind of rigs are either the jack-up rigs, the platform rigs, or so I would explain for that what they are. Then for the floating ones are the ones that go much deeper. They don't touch the seabed. They are floating on the water. So this could be semi-submersible drill ship or drilling barge. Now, all these classification are all for rotary drilling rigs. Why, why I mentioned rotary? Because there are other different kinds of drilling um, uh, systems. Well, basically in the oil and gas, we use the, the rotary. So for the convention, conventional land, this is what it looks like. Um, you see the crown block on top, the derrick man platform, the stand pipe, the traveling block, the rig floor, pipe rack. These are just the basic structures you see. Land rigs. And um, because of time, I cannot go so deep into this because the drilling operation is very wide. So just have in mind that we have a rig that is as simple as this, and this is what we use generally. And now we we can go um, to the marine parts, which is which could be bottom supported, meaning it touches the seabed or the floating ones. Now this is a simple uh, platform rig. On the left is the real picture of the platform rig. On the right is the right is the schematic of what it looks like. Under the rig, you see those um, trusses, those pipes. They go down to the seabed where they are buried and they carry the weight of the entire rig. Because of this um, limitation, they can only be used in very shallow waters. I think about two to three hundred um, feet deep, not very deep. So the right is just a schematic of what it looks like, even under the rig. Now, quickly, we we'll go to a jack-up rig. See the jack-up; it has um, some legs, like four legs. So in this case, it has three. These legs go very deep. And under the, the legs, they have what they call a spot can. It's, it's the shape of a cone, inverted cone. So when these legs are lowered down, when they touch the seabed, naturally the seabed is very soft. So because of the weight and the shape of the cone, it starts burying itself up to a point where it gets miss a consolidated uh, formation. So the, the leg is unlocked, and they do that for the other two legs. Yes, the, sea, the rig is sitting on the seabed. And because of this um, system that 
that part of it is buried into the soil. If you look on the other part of the screen, I don't know if it's there, you see that the brown part is the seabed. You see that part of the earth went into the seabed and met a consolidated formation. So this gives it more rigidity than the other platform. And for this reason, this leg can go into sea waters as deep as that. So this is also for the marine environment. Now we go to the floating rigs, the ones that the legs don't touch the seabed. This is a semi submersible semi because it's not totally submerged, it's partially submerged. Now, when you look at the picture on the left, you just see you may be confused that those legs you see are actually going down to the seabed, but they are not. If you look on the right, you see the legs there. How do we maneuver the heights? Like if we wanted to go lower or wanted to go higher, those columns, some people call it um, pontoons, they have a valve that they can use to suck in water. When they suck in water, the rig goes down lower. If you want to go higher, they expel some water, just buoyancy, and it goes up again. So that way, now you may ask, so how do we put this position in one um, particular place? One, some of them, um, they have um, DP, DP is dynamic position system. Now, before the rig comes to site, we have a company, for me, a company we use a contract of all TV. They use an ROV, they go to the seabed and they mount certain um, um, transmitters in the seabed that is linked to the satellite and the vessel. So around this vessel, they have thrusters, meaning if this wind or the tide, the tide of the sea is trying to push the rig to one direction, the thruster and that, that the opposite direction tries to push it back to the position with the help of GPS transmitters and seabed. So it maintains a particular position. The accuracy for displacement is, I think, one meter. Meaning, no matter how the wind is, it cannot displace this vessel in any direction. It's a very, very accurate system and it works well. This rig drills in water depth as deep as 7,000 feet. In fact, the well we drilled in 2014 was 6,000. So I've been on this rig. This is a Setco Express um, transocean rig, and although right now it's out of service, but it uh, has drilled a lot of wells in Nigeria as I speak. Then the next kind of um, rig I like to talk about is the drill ship. It's usually. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, we can. I noticed. Oh, uh, the slide, the slide went off. As my network, I'm trying to connect it. So, let me just be The next um, kind of um, rigs are the drill ship. And why I'm taking my time to explain all of these um, rigs is because everything about drilling operation is cost intensive. So. We need to decide on the kind of rigs you use for the depending on the kind of uh, operation you are going for. So drill ships are the next, and they have the same capability as the uh, semi-submersible. The advantage submersible. two advantages semi-submersible have over the drill ship is that they are more stable because more surface area is in contact with water, unlike the drill ship. Bigger, heavier, and it's not quite stable like the semi submersible. So, if there's any form of heave, heave is a vertical movement of the sea, sea, sea water. It affects the rig very much. This is like in 10,000. This was the rig we used to drill exploration wells on Zaba Zaba field in 2014, also. A very, very massive rig. But when I was on this, of the vessel. It's bigger, it's more robust. It actually has two, two drilling rig floors. It can do so many activities at the same time. However, it's very expensive. Then for the set express we used the year before, we are paying about $700,000 per day. So you need to be sure of what, if you need this rig before you select it as a drilling. So the rig is made up of different components, irrespective of the rig, whether it's land or offshore. 
you have the power system, which is the system that provides electricity that runs all your machinery on the ring. You have a voicing system. It consists of tools that raise or lower the, the equipment that go into the hole, basically. We have the rotating system. For the beast to drill, it has to be rotated. We have the rotating system. We have the circulating system, which is what um, drives the mud, helps us carry the cotton from the seabed to the surface, uh, protects us from any form of uh, kick or blowout. It gives us a uh, mass. We have the mud. Also, finally, we have the well control system, where you have your BOPs, also for safety. Now, the hoisting system is very simple. It comprises of um, certain parts. Like I said earlier, irrespective of rigging, follow the same philosophy. It must have um, some form of draw works, which are the ropes that lift or lower your drilling um, gears, gears As the swivel, the top drive, the crown block. Uh, we have the Kelly and the... Um, we have a top drive. So it's not well labeled here. But this is just what the hoisting system is. Basically, the hoisting gives you vertical movement up and down only. It doesn't give you rotation in a way. It depends. And it doesn't move your, uh, your equipment. Oh, this is the power system. The system on the left is your power system, composed of most uh, facilities or rigs use uh, diesel engines because we are not connected to power offshore. Even in remote locations, we don't have network uh, power supply, so we depend basically on generators. Then on the right, we have the oil control system. The BOP system is made up of the BOP itself. We have the choke and kill lines. Uh, we have the manifolds, we have the accumulators, and we have the BOP control manifold. Sorry, I'm rushing this. Like, I, I wish I had time, I would go deep in it. But just understand that this is a system that protects the work in case we have a peak or a blowout. It's a safety system that must be in place while we're drilling. So I mentioned earlier that we have three categories of well the exploration, the development, well, the appraisal wells. So we have several wells that fall into any of these categories. For example, we have, um, let's say, wildcats. It's a well that, a name that may not be so familiar with us. Yeah, these are wells that we drill just beside an existing um, well. If the existing well you have already, maybe for one reason or the other, it was poorly managed, drain production, it's producing sand, you try to work with it. Abandoned the other one. It's just a wild, this is a wildcat. Sorry, no, sorry, that's the wildcat is a word that I drill outside the vicinity. Sorry. It's drilled outside the vicinity. It's where I drill, even when a geologist have not done their sizes. So you just want to go and try and see. You drill a wildcat. It's very risky also, just like the exploration well, but it's a kind of exploration well. I mentioned what an appraisal well is. I mentioned what it is. So what I was trying to explain is an offset well. The word I drill just beside an existing well. So for reasons which I've explained earlier, we have production wells. These are wells that produce the oil or gas. Then the opposite direction, we have injection wells. We used to inject probably gas or water. We don't inject oil, like oil is important to us. But there are wells that we can inject oil. They call them storage wells. Like in the US, they buy crude, even crude oil from other countries. They take it down to the have they do especially. And they inject them down and save them there. They have these traps. That are suitable to store oils. They've drilled for so many years. This well, this uh, reservoirs are empty now. They buy the cardon, they inject it and store it. They exist many for an hour. So, what are your wells profiles? They have different kind of profiles, and the profile um, ideally will depend on what you your objectives are or the challenges you may face. Generally, our wells are supposed to be vertical, meaning you just take your rig, mark X on the floor, and start drilling straight down. But this is not always possible for several reasons. In case of drilling up, uh, we are to drill so many wells. We call them uh, slotted drilling. You won't drill for one position. So of course, you need to have different shapes. Then if you need to assess several reservoirs, there's a kind of well that we call the multi-particular wells. You start from the mono bore, which is one bore. So somewhere deep down, you start having different um, 
and wells coming out of the center well. But when they produce, they all come into the center well and come as a production line. So depending on what you, you want to do at Italian this, you may have different profiles. I will explain the profiles in the next slide. We have the vertical profile, but just straight down. You drill straight vertical. These are usually simple, but they are not really, really economical for several reasons, I will explain. They will have the directional wells. When you, when you call a well directional well, it's a well that's... At the initial point, is vertical. It gets to where they call the kickoff point. From that point, you build. Build means you're increasing your inclination away from the vertical. Is it take it requires some form of expertise and then uh, when you've got to the angle you wish you go straight to your target. This is a directional well. People mistake directional well from horizontal wells. They are very, very different. Directional wells are drilled for different one. They have the L shape, which is a pod profile you see here. It looks like an L because it has a vertical and a part that is somehow, somehow horizontal where it's inclined. These are very drilled when you have an obstruction on the surface. So you want to drill, you see your reservoir, they say no, you can't drill here because of maybe there are buildings around there or whatever. They say, okay, go far. But you need to go very far from it to achieve a clearance where you get your approval to spot, spot your wealth. When you drill from that point and you climb straight to your target, is a directional well, but it's an L shape. Now, this other one that looks a bit awkward on the last side is they call it the S, S shape. In this case, you drill just slightly away from the center. It may just because of one small obstruction. Like where we are now, we have so many sub C assets on this. So, if you need to drill a well, we don't shoot a little away from a lamp or a Christmas tree and drill. In this case, we want to, if you want to hit that same target, we'll be drilling what they call the air shape. In this case, you drill vertical, you slant, and you drop vertical again. If you look, it gives like an S profile. So quickly then, I said initially that the directional well is slightly different from the horizontal well. So in the, in the horizontal scenario, when you have built to a certain depth, which is usually it's almost at the same depth of your target, but away from your target, you now project, you go in the right direction and you drill straight 90 degrees. When you get it at 90 degrees, the horizontal well. And I'll explain to you why we drill this horizontal well. Now, there are some reservoirs that are very, very thin. Very thin. When I say thin, I see reservoirs with thickness of just maybe 15 feet, 10 feet. Now, if you drill vertically, in that reservoir. When you perforate that reservoir, you can only perforate 10 feet, which is very small. That reservoir that is thin may be very long. So it means it has quantity, it has sufficient hydrocarbon. But when you perforate, imagine drilling all the oil from just 10 feet. It's just very small. So you have problems of um, water cleaning and gas cleaning. It's, it's inevitable. So in this case, we, it's advisable to drill in that kind of pin layers in a horizontal manner. So instead of perforating just 10 feet, you can perforate as high as even 200 feet, depending on how long the horizontal section is. And you see that the oil goes into the perforation from top by means of gravity, then from under by the support of maybe you have an aquifer. In that case, it comes easily. There's no, there's no problem. In fact, you may not even have this issue of that's going to at all in horizontal wells. So that is one of the advantages of using drill. Explain that we you can drill and deviate, deviated wells or directed wells, directional wells. Usually, when you have obstruction, usually that is the reason. So, but to drill, we need that certain equipment, and uh, we cannot go down physically with our shovel. So we need a drill string and a BHG. The drill strings are just pipes. I'll just quickly explain what composes of. The juicing composes of pipes, but everything is a pipe here on the juicing apart from uh, the beat, which is part of your BHA. So the complete drill, the drill stem consists of a beat and the BHA. I want to explain what the BHAs are. Then on top of the BHAs, you have pipes or drill strings. 
which composes of the drill pipe itself, the heavyweight drill pipe, drill collars, the pipes and subs, float bars and jam. I'll quickly explain what they are. Drill pipes are just pipes. Now, heavyweight drill pipes are important, and I'll explain why. When you carry the straw, we used to drink, um, for example, Coca Cola, just normal straw. It looks rigid itself. By the time you start connecting more straws one after the other under each other, just to have a long section. If you hold it, you see that even when there's a slight wind, it moves left and right. It doesn't, it's not rigid. It's not even easy for it to stay vertical. So we add what they call heavyweight drip pipes under. This will keep your drip, your drill string in tension straight, straight down. We don't want the situation where we are drilling your drip pipe is buckling. It's just going in and out. We have to keep some weight under it. And the weight we put is actually the drip, the heavyweight drip pipe. It's exactly the same as the drip pipe, but it has some form of um, offset which gives extra weight and keeps your drill string vertically straight in a neutral position. Then the next is your drill collars. We had these drill collars for basically to give weight to your drill bits. If you are drilling and you cannot give weight to the drill bits, there are certain formations you may not be able to drill because some formation require you to give extra weight on the bits. They call it weight on bits. So the drill collars are the main thing that gives that weight on bits. And they also support in keeping your drill sink in tension in the vertical uh, position. We have the stabilizers. Anytime you see a sub, the stabilizer is just like a ring. It keeps the drip pipe. You know, the bit is bigger than the drip pipe. So when the hole, as you are drilling, the hole is going down. The stabilizer keeps everything close to the bit, like the BAT. It protects it from hitting the body of the hole. Yeah. It doesn't rub around the hole, so it keeps it it's just straight. It protects it from any from abrasion around the uh, bore hole while we are drilling. Subs are just drip pipes that help us connect. Like for example, you are using a to change it to, for example, five inch. You need a sub. The sub can be a crossover. It can be just a pipe to change even the, the kind of connection you have at the end of your drip pipe. So basically, the length of a drip pipe is nine meters, ten meters, yeah, about. Or we can say thirty feet. So one pipe in itself is a drip pipe, but when you make a Make up three pipes together. You have what they call it. The stand. So the stand, the stand basically is made up of three pipes. Or it can be two. Two when the rigs are smaller, the derrick is not so high. So when they pick it up from the rack and they put it close to the well to run it to the road, derrick um, height is not so high. That rig usually they use two, but generally in the industry is usually three. So we have. Uh, a stand of drip pipe as three pipes made up. So it means one pipe in itself is the drip pipe. Then three pipes composed together is a stand. When you say, when the driller tells the dairy guy, please give me one stand of three and a half, you understand what it means. If you say, give me, so you understand what it means. Say, give me a pipe, you understand what it means. Then jazz. We put jazz, it's a kind of hydraulic, it's a pipe that have a piston inside it. It's like a sleeve. So like telescopic kind of. So if you are drilling and you just pump in your hole, and you are trying to pull, the, the drill sink is not coming out. There's a tension you give and the jar will activate. It's like a force and it snaps. We had one that snapped up, you just want to jar up, and one that snaps, you just want to jar down. So if you are stuck in any position, you can decide to jar up or jar down. It gives an extra force. Which will free your drill, your BHA in case you get stuck. I mentioned that the BHA, which is your bottom is, is the lower part of the drill string. And it consists of the drill bits, mud motor. These days we try to measure while we are drilling. We don't wait for run logs after drilling every session. So we have devices that we put in our BHA that while we are drilling, we are getting real time reading. We also have the system where you can log while you are drilling. Then I will explain what the mod motor is. You know, when you drill the vertical session, most times it's rotary, meaning from the rig floor, the driller is rotating the entire drill. So meaning the drill pipe is rotating, which also which is also carrying your BHA, which and the BHA is carrying the so everything is rotating. But once you choose to go for, uh, in the directional drilling, especially in the horizontal drilling, 
it wouldn't make sense to rotate the entire stream. It wouldn't. So what we do, we install a mod motor. Now what this motor does is when we pump mod through the drip pipe, as it's supposed to, before coming out to the, through the nozzles on the beads, it goes through this motor. This motor has a rotor that rotates the beads itself. So on the rig floor, you, you'll see that the strings are not rotating, but the beads downhole is rotating. So if we want to get more RPM, which is rotation per minute, we just tell the pump man, please. So the more pump you give, the beads rotate faster. In that way, you avoid so many drilling problems. If you choose to rotate, the entire string in a deviated way or direct, the direction of the If I any driller that tries to do that, will get itself fired, I'm sure of that. This is a picture of some of the things I mentioned. The drip pipe, if you look at the second one, your heavyweight drip pipe, you see somewhere along the body at the middle, there's some extra reinforcement. They have the drip color is smooth, but it has some kind of spiral around it because it's close to the beats. If you get stuck, if the pipe is smooth and we have downhill problems like, for example, stock pipe, you won't be able to circulate. But in this case, because it's spiral, it can give you some that advantage of being able to circulate up to the surface. They thought the thought the picture that subs, which I mentioned, are just small pipes that are used to use as crossovers. They will have the stabilizers. This is very close to the bits. Like I mentioned, it protects the bits and the DHA from having an abrasion around the Then the jazz, if you look at it, it's not a normal pipe, like a piston. That's the last picture there. And like I mentioned, we have the ones that jar up and they jar down, just to help you free your drill string in case it gets stuck. So we have beads, which is the most important thing in the drill. Well, not the most important, but something you cannot do without. And they are classified in different ways. We have the fixed cutter and the roller cones. Each of them have their different applications. Diamond beads are one of the strongest beads we have. Strongest beads means that while you are drilling, you don't need to pull out or go to change it severally, like the roller cone beads. But the disadvantage is that it's usually slow. It's not as fast as roller cone beads. And it's very expensive. The roller cone beads, they have a high they drill faster. On the way out easily. So yeah, depending on how deep you are in the well, you know, to change the beads means you need to disconnect all the drip pipes one after the other until the beads gets to the surface. So to disconnect one joint, one stand may take you maybe 10 minutes, depending on how fast the deck answer. So imagine 10 minutes and you are, let's say 3,000 feet deep. And then I remember the previous stand is about 100 feet. Let's say, okay, 90 feet, 30, 30, 30, that is 90. If you 2,000 feet divided by 90 for 10 minutes, you can know how long it takes to get to the beats. Hours. So if you are sure that you're in a situation where you won't require to be changing beats regularly, the tricone beats is the best. What is the disadvantage here? Because the cones, mm -hmm. those three cones you see, they are moving through. So there's a tendency that one can break and fall off into the well. And when that happens, you need to do a fishing job. You cannot continue to drill it. So is that what we did in the industry? Now we have a combination. They call them the hybrid drill bits. The hybrid is a system where they combine both the roller and the diamond with the fish cutter bits. So in that, in that situation, you have an advantage of high rate of penetration, high rate of penetration, and uh, and also means um, fast formations and it's a bit cheaper. So that's just um, the new technology. Many people may have not seen it, but it's new in the industry. Now. We call them the hybrid. It's a combination of the two, and that's what we have here in the lower class. So. In designing a well, it goes through several sequences. One, you have to plan the well. Of course, you perform shallow gas survey. Shallow gas survey uh, basically is to drill a hole. The area you want to drill your main well. You also 
check if there are pockets of gas that can give you problems. You prefer the website, you search your conductor casing, depending on your location in that area, you just go and they pile it, they use pile, pile it and just set it there. Well, Hello, sure, Dan. We, we jet it. We, yeah, can you hear me? Uh, the screen. Yeah, I'm trying to share, but I think it's a network. It's a network. Yeah. Let me share again. Simeon. Yeah, still trying to you share. You have the slide now. Okay, it's there now. It's there now. Okay. It's showing now. Okay. So we prepared your site. We said the conductor casing. Now, the conductor casing basically is to who, because when you start to drill, the first part of the soil you see are very loose. Imagine when you are digging a hole, it keeps caving in, falling. What they do, they set this case to prepare the well to receive the main um, drilling profile, which is your uh, sur your surface casing, intermediate casing, production casing, or liners. The surface casing, the conductor pipe is set to receive every other thing that goes into the well. On the land area, they prepare the, the conductor pipe even before they set up the rig. But offshore, the rig has to come, of course, because we need the rig to drill. And we use a jetting system. We just use normal seawater, pump it down. And as it's jetting, you see the sun just coming out and the beat is going down. We are not rotating. We're just jetting. So you get the hole. The beat is inside the conductor casing itself. So as we are jetting, the casing is just sitting down. To get to a point, we leave it. Just the weight of the casing alone will sink and set at a particular depth. And that is your conductor casing. In, in land area, after it's you the conductor case, that's when you move your rig in and you rig up. Remember, I said offshore, we need the rig to do the conductor case. Then you spot the well. Spotting simply means uh, just take your boot and start drilling. You spot the well, then we drill down to the surface casing depth. Sorry, let me share again. Uh, okay. We spoil the well, we drill down to the surface casing depth. We set your casing. In this case, you drill a hole. The conductor pipe usually is around uh, between 30 and 36. So the next casing that will go inside it definitely should be smaller. We drill a hole with a bit of about 20 inches. And the surface casing basically is drilled to you know protect. The aquifer where we get our drinking water from. And when we are drilling this surface casing, we use a water that is as good as what we can drink. There is oil based model this session. We use water based. I will try to make it um, as safe to use in, uh, synthetic additives sometimes so that it doesn't contaminate the sea bed. The, sorry, the drink water. So once we drill this section, we case it immediately with the, the surface casing. Usually it's 20 inches, depending on what you are, what you are doing. Once you set your surface casing, you cement it, of course. Sorry. Then this is where you store your BOP because you are going deeper. Deeper means the pressure, the pore pressure will increase more. It's more risky at this place, so it's better you set your BOP first on top of the surface casing. And that's when we start the real, real drilling. When you set your BOPs, now you drill and cement your intermediate casing. Intermediate casing could be one, it could be two. So it comes in different sizes. You can have um, three, 13, 3, 8 casing, which would be in a 17 and a half hole. You know, there are different size of cases we use. Why we have different inter intermediate cases because you can encounter several challenges while we're drilling. Imagine where you are drilling and you see a zone that is high pressure, it doesn't follow the normal pore pressure building. Let's say you are supposed to see, uh, let's say, 1000 psi, and you suddenly see 1005, and under it, you are seeing 1003. You need to really, you need to case that area off. So you have to run intermediate cases in all those areas until you get to the top of the reservoir. And then when you drill, you remember you have to use the number of you have open hole up to your top of your reservoir. 
at that point, generally people run open hole logs. As you build, when you get to this level, you drill trees and you run logs. Uh, one of the I think you have an uh, you have so much experience in this kind of um, logging. You run your open hole logs, get other information you need. The if I continue, I need to remember, I want you guys to also know that drilling is not continuous. Even if you are drilling a particular whole session, for example, you are drilling a seven inch hole, depending on how hard the condition is, you may need to change your bit severally. That's why I say bit selection is very, very important. If you, as a drilling engineer, don't select the right bit, it means you'll keep changing bits severally. And every, remember, I told you a daily. The daily rate for the bridge, for example, is about $1 million in the past. So if you imagine that you have to drill, you have to pull out of the hole four times because of poor planning. And each time cost takes about six hours. Yeah, we can't power, which $1 million loss due to just poor planning. So you need to understand that you have to, this selection is very, very critical. which we call the production casing. They call it production casing because it runs to the, into the reservoir where production will take place. And this is the casing that is usually perforated. So I run that production casing for the, the commission engineers and they do the completion. Perforate, put your, your tubing hanger, your tubings, connect it to the Christmas tree, remove the BOP, they will start we leave the rig, and that's the end of the, uh, the drilling operation. Now, what typically what it looks like is something like this. I mentioned that the initial part of the surface is usually composed of loose sand materials. So that's where we put our conductor pipe first, and the next one is surface hole casing. It protects the pressure tank and provides support for the BOPs. This is the casing that carries the BOP. The next phase is the intermediate casing. Remember, the profile gets smaller, meaning the size of the bit also will be reduced. Intermediate casing are isolated formation, which have different pore pressures. I explained that you can encounter areas that are, that are not. Um, Otherwise, cannot continue drilling. So also, it ensures higher integrity at the case issue for deeper drilling with higher bodies. Remember, as we go deeper, pressure increases. So to keep adding, putting additives, increasing the density of your mod. But remember, as you are increasing the density of your mod, if you have not cased in the upper areas, they may have to encounter some form of in, you can have a fracture. In that case, we get losses, which would now translate to and loss. So very important that we know when to put our intermediate cases. To drill to the depth and through the production intervals, that we usually drill through the reservoir. They isolate oil and gas zones for perforation, completion, simulation. There are actually four different broad topics that can be taken on a different day. Luckily, I have um, experience in completion, so if there's a good time, I can also delve into that. So, like I said earlier, no job offshore or onshore as far as related to drilling goes easy. We always have challenges. Some of the challenges you can see are stock pipe and uh, stock pipe gates. I don't want to go into the challenges. Stock pipe is basically a situation where you are drilling and your drill string gets stuck on the zone. For different reasons, it could be differential stock, meaning that um, imagine where your, your drilling mod is given an isostatic pressure, for example, 1000 uh, psi, and information at that place is much more lower, let's say 850 or 700. The sockets kind of because the pressure from the inside is way, way, way over than the pressure is supposed to be. They give like a suction kind of. And your pipe gets stuck. It sounds funny, but the driller will try to pull up, it cannot pull up. Try to pull down, it cannot pull down. So 
that's one talent we have, and there are solutions to that. Those solutions also the maybe it's too heavy, and it's just going um, into your formation. If you miss a zone where it's usually very under pressure, and let's say around that area you need a certain pressure, unfortunately, you start having losses. If your pressure, your mod weight is too heavy, or the porosity of sorry, the permeability in that zone is too high. We may have losses. We have lost circulation. It's advisable to pump certain pills, ensure that your filter kick is also very good to prevent this kind of situation. And lost circulation is very dangerous because as you are losing you are in a situation where you, let's say you are you are disconnecting, you are pulling out uh, drip pipes. At that point, you are not pumping in mode. So you are relying on the hydrostatic of the mold to protect you. If energy is having some kind of forces, means the column of the mold starts decreasing, meaning your hydrostatic pressure will decrease. If it decreases to a certain level, you may start having kick. And if it's not noticed early, to act, you have blowers. The loss of is very dangerous. It can be partial, it can also be total losses, depending on how severe it is. There are borehole instabilities. Our formations are not homogeneous or true. So it's this instance to be missed from places where there has shields. And shield has a lot of um, high affinity for water. So if you see a shield, it's like clay. If it takes in water, it swells. And when they swell, they start falling into the hole. Imagine your beat is down hole and you have so many um, shields. They call it sloughing. It sloughs into the well. You can even bury your, your drill string down. And if you have a jar, or you don't have a jar, so unfortunately, what you do, you have to go cut the pipe and you abandon that well. So we have mobile formation. We also have salt. They call them salt domes. And uh, let's say the salinity of your mud is not in the right um, uh, proportion. You may have some form of salt swelling. And it can swell so bad that it can also form a bridge and even, you know, seal your well off. So it's also something we don't want. It's something that can be encountered. It has the same uh, situation with shields when they swell too. And plus, kind of, you swell and you move and it can seal your formation off. You also, you have to make sure that your, you have the right additives, the inhibitors that will prevent this kind of things from Gauge holes where you are drilling. Remember this: the, the open hole is also abrasive on your drill bit. So you, or you may not you may not notice, but the diameter mm. of the bit may be shrinking. So your hole is getting narrower. You won't know. So when let's say, let's say you pull out that bit, I want to run a new bit of the same size. I already at one thousand feet. When you get to, for example, nine hundred, you see that you cannot go deeper. So you know that from nine hundred, your the gauge of your hole started narrowing because. Called the wear and tear of your bit. Your bit was actually shrinking, you know. I mean, the diameter of your bit. So it's a problem that if you're not a seasoned driller, you may not notice on time. The kicks and blowouts at harvest. It depends on the kick. There's an unwanted intrusion of um, water or hydrocarbon fluids from your formation into the well due to usually. Mm -hmm. It can be controlled, but when you fail to control that, it goes out of control. It's called a blowout. This is just a basic uh, difference. So, um, I think I'll stop here in terms of my teaching and just have a quick exercise. These are the kind of questions. It's elementary, but it tries to capture most of the concepts I've been discussed earlier today. Yes, sir, you are an engineer. Yeah, because I believe you all are now doing engineers. You've been asked to plan a well with the following information. Any place you see asterisk is a place that wants us to provide them um, answers. And this is information they give to you. The well will be located on an existing production field offshore. So what it means is that first it's not an exploration well. So it's not an appraisal well because we have wells already produced in that field. So most likely you are going to drill a development well could be a production well or a gas injection well or water injection well. 
But first, you know, it's a development zone. Now, the first thing. Now, it's, this well will be located offshore with a water depth of 2,000 feet. Now, this water depth will ask, make you ask questions. So, what kind of rig am I going to use? The semi submersible likewise the drill ship. But they mentioned that the, the sea condition is very rough. Now, I remember I mentioned that the semi sub has more balance offshore. You can withstand the sea condition better than the drill ship. And also, it is cheaper. In any way you want to look at this, it, it's wiser to use a semi submersible. So, we have gotten two points. We are drilling a, a development. And we have decided that it's cheaper for us to use a semi submersible. We can use a jack up rig or a platform rig for the purpose of the depth to mention that they cannot go beyond 500 feet. So, our next short bet is a semi submersible. Now, we'll continue. We've gotten two points we need. So there are many other subsea assets already existing on the seabed above our target. So the warehead will not be located directly over the land. Already they're telling you prepare. They are going to drill a directional drilling because they told you directly above reservoir, there are assets there. Because it's an old tree already producing. So maybe there are a lot of pipelines flowing under there. So you have to shift to a distance. So you have to prepare for a directional drilling. So when you are doing your drilling plan, the first thing in your first meeting, you tell them, guys, we are having, we are planning a directional drilling. So now we'll continue. So now it's on So seismic data from previously drilled wells show that the stratigraphy is composed primarily of sandstone and shields. Now I told you what, what um, happens in your drilling selection usually is the kind of formation you need. And of course, cost. I mentioned that the tricone bit is effective when it comes to formations that are not very hard. Diamond bits, which are very good, are good in hard formations. So for sand and sandstone and shields, you know, we can use the tricone bits. It's cheaper, remember I said that. And uh, also, you know, it has a very high rate of penetration. So, Generally, you can consider in our first meeting that guys, when we're looking for bits, we should focus more on tricone bits. Then also, we continue also at 1,000 feet below seabed. There's a layer of salt dome. What is salt dome? This information means you need to be very careful. We need to really plan our intermediate casings properly. Uh, we also need to be wary of the kind of directional drilling we are going to drill. It may be the airship. It might be the L shape. So if we're trying to avoid the salt dome, let's say it doesn't cut through the area where it's just a small portion, maybe uh, S shape, because S shape gives you the opportunity to avoid several um, some, some bottom hole challenges. So we have to know is we have to plan our intermediate case very well. I need to inform the mod engineer of this information. Although they'll be part of the meetings, but we need to uh, impress this information on them so that we prepare when we get to that depth. The final reservoir height is thin, with very low permeability, with gas and water cooling problems. Since the thin reservoir, instead of doing a directional drilling, in this case, my end. So we're trying to avoid the issues of gas cooling and water cooling problems, and the said reservoir is thin. So do you, the yeah, horizontal drilling will give us the opportunity to perforate a longer depth so we can drill and produce properly without issues. So, if this kind of um, problem is presented to you and you enter the first meeting, you can easily contribute and say, Yes, well, we, we need, uh, we're going to drill the production well. And for what I see, we need a semi sub. I believe it's more economical. Can go straight to say yes because of the sub uh, bottom more challenges we are going to focus on the horizontal drilling and of course more the engineers still be careful we have challenges of salt dooms when we get to that point we'll let you know it's just a way of uh, joining the conversation and believe me this is just the skeleton of uh, this is the foundation. Any other thing you see is just an improvement of what we have said. And believe me, you won't hear anything far from what we've already discussed. So just to conclude, uh, drilling is one of the 
crude oil gas from the reservoir. It's important to weigh the advantages and disadvantages of each drilling method. This may differ according to the drilling sites, but overall, the advantages are most effective. Radial drilling bits are also available and chosen according to the type of sediments to be drilled. Hyd hybrid drill bits were found to be most useful. I mentioned that the cost of drilling is expensive. Therefore, it is very, very, very vital to inspect conditions at which drilling will take place so that maximum crude oil and gas can be produced. So thank you very much for listening. Wow. Available for questions. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Engineer Dan Maduago. Thanks for sharing your wealth of experience with young professionals of SPC 103. And I believe that uh, many of us are doing engineers now, <laughs> like you rightly pointed out. Very uh, explanatory, straight on point. And even someone that has not uh, entered a class in drilling engineering before, seeing this alone, even not being a personal engineering student, can just key in and learn. Thank you so much again. So we'll take questions. I already have some questions on the, on the group. Sorry, on the chat, uh, okay. we've gone behind, behind time. So probably uh, I will just take the questions we have on the chat. Hope we are fine with that. Okay. That has always been our culture and how we do it. So we don't unmute people to start asking direct questions. So that's why if you, why the presentation was going on, I type something on the chat that you can drop your questions. So probably you can still drop your question. I uh, will take a maximum of six questions. We have three on the group already. So probably you can just drop your questions then. So then are you ready for the questions? You make it as brief as possible. Are you there, sir? Yes, I am. Okay, number one question from uh, Juwo Adebi. Uh, question one, under which category of marine rigs does SPA fall under? That SPA has spelled, under which category of marine rigs does SPA fall under? That's S-P-A-R. Okay, spa rigs, spa rigs, spa rigs. Spa rigs, uh, it means spa rigs. Under which category does spa rigs fall? In the marine. Uh, okay, like, for spa rigs, I think it's, it's offshore because I know it's a floating rig. It's offshore, yes, sir. Uh, and it's, yeah, and they use it deep offshore. So when you say which categories, already we know it's marine. And uh, for it to be a spa rig, it's marine, it's offshore. offshore. I, I, so I, I think if... it's like similar to it's like similar to tension legs. Yes, 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 yes. I've forgotten the full meaning. It can also be it's similar to it's tension like legs. A, a bit, yeah. It's a bit cylindrical. It's like it's like a tension leg. Yes, yes, that's true. It's like tension legs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If he's asking, uh, if it's it gets to the seabed, I mean, maybe that's what he's trying to ask. I don't know. I think it doesn't get to the same. It probably it's just the way they, it, it, it's, it's like just uh, the way the tension legs are dynamic positioned. Yeah, kind of. Oh, uh, dynamic gets position. Seabed, uh, I think. Get to the seabed, yeah. Anyway, I think it depends. There are, there are different kinds. There are kinds that where it floats, then they, get, they use like, um, I think, anchors. Anchor um, chains. That's and anchor them to the seabed. So the column itself doesn't exactly touch the seabed. But the anchors go to the seabed. So I don't know if I'll call it floating or uh, contact with the seabed. Know, it's in between, in between the two. It's floating, but it's okay. anchored to the seabed. OK, the, the, the second question here is, is it possible to have primary and secondary Intermediate well casing. Yes. 
Is it possible to that. have primary and secondary intermediate well cases? I explained to you what the intermediate cases are. They are basically to protect, uh, isolate, inside those zones. Areas are challenging. So when you are training, you run the first one. You can run on, you can run on that one inside. If you have, if you encounter another challenge, on that one. So you can have more than one. Yes, but of course they can't be the same size. So your present okay. is always advisable to use one of the biggest sizes, but you don't know if you may need to run on that one inside of it. Okay. Thank you for that. The third question is, apart from barite, which is commonly used as drilling mold, what other materials can be used as drilling mold and which is more efficient? Well, I don't think there's a not very clear for two reasons. Coverite has its own function. That is a weighting material. They use it to increase the weight of your the density of your mold. Then uh, you have other so Depending on the kind of mold you have, you know it has different purposes. We have inhibitors that are added. So when you say which one is more, maybe don't cast and throw more light on that. But I know it depends on what your focus is. It's for weighting, I know bentonite can be used to increase the weight. Uh, sorry, density, the viscosity rather. We have a um, formation. We have additives for gel strength to give it the gel uh, for, for, uh, capability so that even if you're not circulating, your body is in suspense. Yeah. So it depends on what you are what you are hoping to achieve. But for B right, B right is basically to increase the weight of your mod. I think okay. The, okay. okay, thank you. I will I will ask a question, but let me just uh as we are making the presentation, we have uh, uh some of our senior members that joined the call. We have uh Professor Chibu Exe is one of our presenters. Uh, for November technical lecture. Uh, he's here. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. And uh, we had uh, uh, an engineer all the way from Abu Dhabi, uh, Chinedu, that is more into drilling and completion too. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. And we have a, uh, another uh, completion uh, person from Baker Ekene. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Ogajiwon Adebi, thank you for joining us. These are seasoned professionals, and uh, someday we'll call on you to do something that Dan just did for us, all about sharing knowledge and information. So, Dan, I don't have any questions on the log, but I will ask a, a direct question concerning the possibilities of a local drilling fluid. We understand how expensive drilling fluids are. They are the they are yeah. They are the, the alpha and omega when it comes to drilling because it goes in, takes the cotton, it's multidisciplined in the rig. Now, probably, have we considered, uh, because I've been told, I've seen some drilling fluid from Nigeria. Is, is there any way, have we had any local produced drilling fluid in Nigeria? Because it runs into millions of dollars. Or uh, uh, have you come across any localized uh, Nigeria drilling fluid? Well, if you are asking me that question, I can answer you directly. In fact, we have one specialist here that, that has designed the wonderful additive for drilling fluid using tiger nuts. Tiger nuts. So, okay, <laughs> 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 so, Okay, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> she's still online. I don't know if she's still online. <laughs> she's, not she's, she's not online. <laughs> okay, okay. So I'll just open. Was, uh, actually. <laughs> okay. Okay, go ahead. I don't know if a uh, prof. Prof, do you have anything to tell us, please? Hello, prof.
Prof, are you, are you there? Professor Chibo is it? I don't think it's that. It's not there. Can you unmute Ekele, please? And make a contribution. I know you're a wireline engineer. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Good um, evening, Ekele. Yeah, my name is Ekele Otugeme, wireline field engineer for Baker Hughes. So for me, rather than contribute, I want to instead say thank you. Okay, so this will be my first um, YT lecture I'm attending as a member of SP. And so hearing how um, engineer Daniel took us through the entire drilling operations process, like how you explain to a primary one, primary two child, I couldn't help but get my, my tally book and I was writing a, a lot. So I want to say a big, big thank you to engineer Daniel. I learned a lot especially on the difference between directional drilling and horizontal drilling. I've never seen it in that light before. And it, it all makes sense on why we have to go directional or go horizontal, amongst the number of other things that you talked about. So thank you very much, um, Engineer Daniel. And thank you, um, YP, thank you, YP um, Section 103. Thank you, everybody. OK. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you so much. Chine Du. Chine Du, no bet. Are you there? Yes, yes, yes. I'm here. Okay, your contribution. Uh, I'm sorry, first of all, I came late. Um, so it's nice to be here. Um, yeah, thanks for the invite. I think this is my first time to to be part of this. You no, know, I have had a couple of times that uh, Woody have told me that because of operations and jobs, right? So I don't, I don't have much to say. My only contribution because I'm, I'm listening to this um, talk, it's more like we have a lot of new people in the field and all those stuff. Maybe some of them might be students, so I need to get a clearer picture. But that, if it does it. The only thing I could say is because um, it's a very interesting industry. That's one. So having opportunity to have started my career back in Nigeria before leaving to work out in Nigeria, one of the things I could say is um, whatever you're doing, just keep giving your best. Uh, there's something I always tell people, um, no matter what Nigeria is, it's amazing. It's one of those places to always start your career. And I've seen the difference starting career back in Nigeria and being transferred to another country, there's a lot of big, there's a big difference. Like whenever you go, you see this, this, there's a massive, there's an, there's an improvement. Like you like more like you have a lot of experience. You are Nigerians, we are good. Like we are good. Starting your career in Nigeria, it's something very good. You're going to get experience, hands on experience. You're going to know what you're doing. So when you are outside, you're going to see the difference. Like when you are in, 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 in the company of your colleagues from other countries, you always stand out because it's always, I, used to, I keep telling people that wherever you are working in Nigeria, no matter the kind of, no matter maybe you might say, oh, this is an indigenous oil field or this is not, just try and put in your best because whatever you're going to gain there, whatever you're going to learn, sometimes it's going to be tough. Going to work extra hours, you're going to maybe work with some bosses that are going to push you. Just have it in mind that they are doing you a, a very, a, 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 they're doing something very good because with those experiences you've gotten, with those policies you've gotten from Nigeria, because Nigeria we really put in our best, like we have been pushed and we do, we do well. When you when you get the opportunity to step outside and work in the same or you feel but outside the country, you will see a big difference that it's amazing to start your career in Nigeria. You learn a lot, you pushed a lot, like this type of forums, all those stuff, work with people, learn very well, and then try to know if you have questions you ask. And it's it's really amazing. So I appreciate what you guys are doing, uh, coming up with this. Uh, so I'll try and be involved once in a while and get myself involved in this. It's really interesting. And kudos to 
the guy that I really explained, man, you know, you know your stuff, so and you really explain it very well. Like even somebody that even that's not even the field that listen to what you're saying will really learn something, learn something from it. So cheers, guys, and um, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Nobit. Thank you. Uh, let me thank everybody for this section. Uh, Ukeme, Elijah, still on standby. You take the closing prayer. I I want to thank everybody. Uh, this is our first technical meeting for this year. Uh, let's thank our presenter, Engineer Dan Madogo, for doing an excellent job. We can't thank you enough. Whenever we call upon you, despite the tight schedule, you're always there to do your bidding and to share your wealth of knowledge as a season professional. You, you didn't just start today, right from when you were the technical chairman of TIG, Technical Interest Group for Uniport. You've always showed us then that you have the potential to do the extraordinary in your chosen career. And we can't thank God enough for taking you. So thank you so much on behalf of the section. I uh, will celebrate you. I would say uh, more grace to your career projection. I just want to call up everybody on this thank call. You thank you, sir. Just a quick one on membership. Uh, you can now renew your membership. And for those of us that are not yet members, we use the opportunity to plead that you become members of SP for that course section. It's a very simple process, uh, sp.org or you can reach on any of us, the admin or myself or the membership chair. We're supposed to have a membership drive slide, but it's not available currently. But uh, you can see these are the advantages of being a member of SP. SP believes in sharing technical information and projecting value of its members. In, in outside Nigeria, uh, non-members hardly participate in technical lectures like this. Uh, because you must be a member that's up to the up to date with your dues payment. But in Nigeria today, we are trying to make uh, everything possible to get our people in the professional space to grow and to learn the new trend in the in industry, innovation in industry. So probably, aside what we do here today, we have different study groups. That's why you have to become an SP member so you can go into study groups. And that's why this year, this board year, we are going across our uh, geosciences, geophysics, seismic exploration, analysis, we're going to drilling, we're going to completion, we're going to access management, we're going to facilities, we're going to project management and HLC. These are all different aspects of, of uh, the, the, the energy mix to make you uh, a round figure of a dumb engineer. So you can see that we are doing a lot from our session. So you have to support the section by being active as an SP member, paying your dues and benefiting from a, a opportunity. Two days from today, we have our distinguished lecture program that's going to hold in the section. I don't see Simon, I don't know if you can share the link. Can you drop the link in the chat group? Hello, Simeon. If you can drop the link for registration, registration closes in two days and it's free. We have a, a, a distinguished lecture in two days, 28th of January, and the link is on the chat. You can click there and register immediately and have access because only registered member we have access for the technical presentation. So these are the benefits attached to SP, despite the networking, despite the career counseling. In our different study groups, you choose your, the area you have strength, where we have mentors that are seasoned profession, they chat you up, they give you a mentorship program for one year, two years, six months, depending on your specification. And you add direct questions like people like Daniel, people like Chile, do people like Ekene, they are all in the field, probably. And you can network with them, ask direct questions, and you get all the answers you need. So thank you so much, everybody. In two days, we have our first distinguished lecture for January. It is a board program, it's a section program. It's a section program. So please, uh, most of us that are here that are not members, we can be members. The link has been shared on, a, on the chat. Please, if you've already started for the Distinguished Lecture, it's on the chat now. You can click on the link and you can register and they will send you a mail to participate on 28th. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you so much.
Kabiwe Odum, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Olufemi, Taiwo, thank you so much. Stella Obudu, thank you so much. Emmanuel Aderibe, thank you so much. Chukemeka Asadu Domes, thank you so much for having us here, at least for joining and uh, learning from our seasoned professionals. So I'll call on uh, Ukeme Elijah for the closing prayer. In Jesus' name. Oh, okay. In Jesus' name. Amen. But well, we thank you for today. We thank you for the strength. We thank you for the intelligence. We thank you for the mind, the innovative mind to gather here today in this uh, meeting. Thank you, Lord, for the um, organizers that put this together. We thank you for the strength you give, Lord Jesus, to the person that presented. Thank you for the grace of everyone to be here. We thou exalted in Jesus' name. But I ask that what we've learned today shall stick with us in Jesus' name. And thank you, Lord Jesus, as we are proceeding forward on today and, and the rest of the week, we ask for your guidance and your direction in Jesus' mighty name. We ask for strength for SPE 103 and SPE International at large. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So please, we can go on the chat and we can see the link for the distinguished lecture that is going to take place on 28th. You can just click on that link directly, take you to the registration page where you give us your details. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you and have a great evening. God bless you all. As we click on the chat box and ready start for deal in two days. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.